Hello, so it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I unfortunately just arrived, so I didn't talk to almost any of you. So if I am too fast or tell you something you want to know more about, ask me questions. If I'm too slow and you say, I, I, we already heard about this uh, the past two days, then also tell me and we can go faster. So what I want to uh, tell you about a bit in this uh, lecture and the next one is about uh, geometric structures on surfaces. And so for this, we first look at surfaces without any geometry, so just as topological objects. So we'll look at uh, uh, mainly surfaces um, in the sense of saying that they're two-dimensional, uh, compact manifold without boundary. And so topologically, they are classified. And basically, you can draw pictures of any such surface. So the simplest surface is a sphere, so the boundary of a, um, of a ball. And um, then the next surface is a torus, which looks like a donut. And the next surface is a double torus, and then so on. And if you just look at the surface without any geometric structure, so just as a topological space, it's classified by one number, which is called the genus. And that's just how many, if you start with the surface of a ball, how many handles do you have to attach to this ball so that the surface you look at is the surface of this shape. So this has genus 0, this has genus 1, and this has genus 2. And then we have genus bigger than two. Come here. So now what we want to understand is um, how can we endow such a thing with a geometry? And the first thing we're going to look at is the most, uh, in some sense, simplest <coughs> kind of geometry we can put up on the surface where every point on the surface in the neighborhood of any point looks exactly the same. So we want to um, put a structure on the surface which is, in some sense, as homogeneous as possible. And uh, the first geometric structure we want to look at, and we mainly will look at that, are geometric structures really in the sense of Riemannian geometry or, or metric geometry. Um, so we want structures where you can measure distances between points, where you can measure angles, and so on. And so if we try to do that for the surface, there's a, a very famous uh, theorem, which is called the uniformization theorem. which says that any such surface admits precisely one metric, or one structure of a Riemannian metric of constant curvature. And depending on what the topological invariant of the, of the surface is, so what its genus is, uh, the curvature uh, takes different values. So the sphere um, has a constant uh, a metric of constant curvature uh, plus one. The torus has a metric of constant curvature zero, so we can think of it as being glued out of a piece of paper, uh, which we identify two sides. We have a long cylinder, and we imagine identifying the two other sides. And as soon as we have genus two or bigger, the metric and the structure we can put on the surface is a, a Riemannian metric of constant curvature minus one. So, and this will be the geometric structures we will look at in more detail. So every uh, surface of genus G bigger or equal than 2 carries a hyperbolic structure by which I mean uh, Riemannian metric of constant curvature equal to minus one. And another way of thinking of it is, as I mentioned in the beginning, so is to somehow, m if you don't know what the Riemannian metric is, don't, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to give you the definition. Um, but 
so uh, you, could, you should think of this structure as modeling your surface um, on a model space, and every neighborhood on your surface looks exactly as a, mo as a neighborhood in the model, sp model space. So equivalently, we can think of this as giving an atlas from the surface, where for every neighborhood we uh, map it into a uh, uh, homogeneous, nice homogeneous space, meaning the hyperbolic plane. And if we'd have two charts which overlap, so then if we look at the map in the hyperbolic plane, which sends uh, this piece to this piece, this is given by an isometry. Okay, so the first thing I want to discuss a bit, and we spend some time discussing, what does, how does this model space look like? And probably, yes? You didn't say orientable in the definition. Yes, actually, sorry, I wanted to say that. So two-dimensional orientable. So if, if, if you didn't have orientable, you still get geometric structures? Yeah, you still have geometric structures. But of course, I mean, you could have things which are orientation pre, uh, reversing. So for example, if you think of the, if you think of a Möbius band or Klein bottle, I mean, you think of the, I mean, if, if you, if you take a strip of paper, you can glue the Möbius band, right, by yeah. uh, gl uh, gluing it with a half twist when you glue it together. And if you think of this long Möbius band, you can now take the, uh, the ends and glue them together, or you could take a cylinder and glue it somehow the other way around. So these, for example. And the hygienist ones are very Higher genus, yeah, you can do the same thing, but I will really just talk about oriental ones. Okay. <coughs> um, okay, so the first thing I want to discuss is how does the hyperbolic plane look like? The second thing I want to discuss uh, which in a bit more detail how do we actually endow a surface with a hyperbolic structure. And the third question I want to address is if we have a surface, uh, well, there might not just be one way to put a hyperbolic structure, but there might be many ways, and we want to look at how does the space of all possible hyperbolic structures look like. So. Then and there, I'm not sure if we will get to that, but otherwise, I'm happy to uh, answer questions uh, later in uh, private discussions about this. Uh, w if we f have time, I would like to discuss some uh, examples where we go uh, beyond hyperbolicity. So we look at geometric structures on surfaces, which are not anymore uh, hyperbolic structures. Okay. So let's look at the hyperbolic plane. So this is really the space on which we want to model um, our surface. And uh, the hyperbolic plane doesn't have an, uh, a good representation in Euclidean 3 space. So in mathematical terms, there's no isometric embedding of the hyperbolic plane in Euclidean 3 space. So whenever we try to visualize it or discuss it, we have to compromise on something. And that's why it's very useful to have very different models on how to look at the hyperbolic plane. Um, so the first uh, I want to discuss is what's called the hyperboloid model. And this looks at the hyperbolic plane in a similar way as we usually look at the sphere. So we have the sphere. We think of it as sitting in Euclidean 3 space as the set of vectors of norm 1. 
right? So when we look at the hyperboloid model, we also look at uh, three space hyperboloid. So we look at R3, but now we don't endow it with um, the Euclidean scalar product, but we endow it with a Minkowski scalar product. So we think of this, sometimes people also write R12. So it means we put a scalar product, which I will put an M for Minkowski, which, what does it mean? So if we take two vectors in R3, then their scalar product is um, given by taking the product of the two first components, but with a minus, and then taking the product of the second two components and the third two components with a plus. So for the Euclidean scalar product, we have that, and we just change the sign, this one. So if we do that, so then we can look at the um, sphere with respect to this metric, and what's the sphere with respect to metric? So now you have to make a choice where you choose plus or minus, and we will choose minus. Um, so the hyperboloid model, we look at all um, vectors in R12, such that the Minkowski scalar product, or norm squared of this vector, is equal to minus 1. Um, OK. so. Uh, this is, I mean, you can, can try to draw, so this is something like that. But there's a, I mean, we have actually can take the vector, or if we take minus the vector, um, we have the same thing. So we usually add second condition, and we just take one of these hyperboloids, namely the one where the first coordinate is positive. So this is our... Um, our space, and now you can do a lot of things similar as how you would do it for the sphere. So, for example, if we want to describe the tangent space at a point, um, so let's, and here we have uh, zero, right? Here we have the uh, first um, axis, and I mean, this thing goes to one. So, if we have any vector in here, we can look at the tangent space at this point of the hyperboloid model, and this is the orthogonal complement of this vector with respect to this Minkowski scalar um, product. Right? And then you do, in order to get uh, now uh, uh, a non-symmetric bilinear, uh, a symmetric non-degenerate bilinear form on each of the tangent space, uh, which would give you uh, a Riemannian metric, is uh, what you do is um, you take the Minkowski scalar product and you just restricted to this orthogonal complement. So this is the metric at point B. Or let me, let me write it H up here and at point B. Um, so there's one thing you have to check is that this actually gives you, I mean, though you start with this Minkowski thing, and this gives you a positive definite bilinear form on this subspace. Right. Okay, so now um, you have that. Now you, I mean, if we look at uh, geometric space, we might want to look at other things. So, uh, okay, so angles we can always define when we have this uh, scalar product in the in the tangent space because we just take the same formula for the sine of an angle as in Euclidean space. We have sine of v and uh, w is scalar product between v and w divided by uh, the norm of v, norm of w. The other thing you can do is you can measure length of curves. So similar as you do when you measure length of a curve in Euclidean space, right? You take at each point you have a tangent vector to the curve. You take its norm and you integrate over it, and then you can look at shortest curves just as taking the infimum of the length of all curves between two points. So then you might want to understand how do shortest curves look like in your space, and here. If you look at uh, shortest curve between two points, or also geodesics in the Riemannian sense, they have a very um, simple geometric description. They are the intersection intersections of your hyperboloid with planes to the origin. So planes through 
zero. So I'm not going to try to draw that, but uh, so if you if you have a vector here and you have a tangent space, a tangent vector, you have a point V on the hyperboloid and a tangent space U uh, at that point, you can just take the plane generated by U and V through the origin and this will intersect and then you can also think about how to actually parametrize this geodesic as parametrized curve, but uh, this you can do in the exercise if you want. Okay, so this is in some sense the um, one of the most natural um, models of the of the hyperbolic plane and we will start with this model and now derive from this one other models um, we have. So the first one, so the next one we want to derive from and is what is called the Klein model. Um, and for this we uh, do the following, so here we looked at vectors in R12 but now we can um, basically take uh, uh, take a vector and just think of it uh, the line it generates, right? Every vector here generates a unique line. So we can think of the space of lines uh, in R3, which is a protective space of dimension 2, and we can think of what the hyperboloid gives us in this um, model. So let's call this B. So this is... Uh, space of line, say it's this line is R V in um, P of R 1, 2. And now what's the condition we have? So the vector was uh, at uh, inner product with itself minus 1. And so we just uh, have to have that the, if we take, um, let me for this, let me write uh, Q of V, for V, comma V, M. So Q and we restrict it to L, uh, this is negative. <coughs> right? and for every vector in this line, we have negative. So how does this look like? So we can think of this in this picture. So in order to visualize this, we pick some affine chart. So how this looks like will depend on which affine chart we pick. And one of the simplest affine chart we can pick is the plane which goes through one in the first coordinate vector. And then if we project, so we project this hyperboloid uh, from zero, so what we get is uh, actually a bore. <coughs> but if you take a different plane, for example one which is tilted, we will not get a ball, you will get an el ellipsoid. Right? So now what, uh, uh, when we look at this model of the, of the hyperbolic um, plane, so what, what is, how do geodesics look like if we uh, take what we know here, geodesics are intersections of planes through the origin with the hyperboloid, how does a, uh, the intersection of a plane through the origin looks like with this thing? So what is it? Anyone? It's just a straight line. So geodesics are just straight lines. Um, so how does the metric look like? And so this is, it's in this model, it's trickier to write down the um, Riemannian metric. One, so it's easier to write down just the distance function. So let me write down the distance function for you. So so if I have two points, uh, P and Q, I want to uh, compute what is the distance between P and Q. So what I can do so I think can take the um, straight line uh, spanned by P and Q and it will hit the boundary in two other points uh, P bar and Q bar. So whenever I have two points I take the line I get four points on the line and four points on the line have an invariant which is called the cross ratio and now I just write it down first and then I will we will actually go and explain the cross ratio. So the distance function is I take the cross ratio of P bar p q q bar. I might take the absolute value, take the log, and take the absolute value, and that's the distance from p and q. Okay, and this uh, this thing which you can define without uh, talking about the Riemann metric, something will, if you compare it with uh, this model of the hyperbolic plane, will precisely give you the hyperbolic distance between two points. So. 
<coughs> so the disk gives uh, gives the hyperbolic. Okay, so let's. So let me now uh, tell you. So now we take a digression, and I'm not going to tell uh, discuss uh, so the other two models I want to discuss, but. Uh, we're going to say, I will give you the definition of what the cross ratio is and um, give you some properties of the cross ratio. And for that, we actually want to work in a slightly a bit more uh, generality. So we uh, want to work really on uh, uh, C. And uh, if you want C, the extended um, complex plane, so C hat, or just C union infinity, or you could also think of it um, as CP1, so as is a complex protective space, so lines in C2. Um, so let's uh, define the cross ratio. So the cross ratio is an invariant of four points, so Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4. And uh, then you basically want to write down an invariant which makes, this is, makes, ha makes it have as big of a group of symmetries as possible. And uh, to that, so find it as Z1 over Z2, divided by Z1 over Z3, Z4 over Z3 uh, divided by Z4 over Z2. Um, so this makes sense whenever uh, these are distinct and non-zero. Mm -hmm. um, and there, you have to be a bit careful when you look at, the, uh, at cross ratios, so there are different conventions of how to normalize. So I mean, you can do any permutation of z1, z2, z3, z4, and then and there's another thing you could do in the exercises is see how does the cross ratio look looks like uh, after a permutation. But I mean, whatever you pick is basically fine, and I take no guarantee that the one I picked here and the one I picked there actually, uh, uh, yeah, are are compatible. Okay, so um, we have the cross ratio and. Um, this, this cross ratio will play an, um, uh, plays an important role. And the other thing which plays an important role is the group of symmetries of the cross ratio of transformations uh, of C infinity or CP1, which preserve this uh, cross ratio. And that's the um, group of Möbius transformations. I also want to introduce those here. So So a Möbius transformation is a map um, oh, is a map, say F from C hat to C hat, given by a fractional linear transformation. So given by Z goes to AZ plus B divided by CZ plus D, or A, B. Uh, CD <coughs> are uh, complex numbers, and you want that um, AB minus CD is uh, equal to 1. Um, okay, so you could also just have it's non zero, it's also fine. Okay, so what's the, how can you think of the group of, uh, this group of Möbius transformations? It is, it's very convenient to think of it as a matrix group. So we will. <coughs> hmm? Question? No? Yeah? Uh, is it really AB minus CD, not AT minus CD? Uh, sorry, A, the determinant. Let's see. Yeah. OK, so how do we think of it as, uh, as a group of uh, uh, two by two um, complex matrices? So. One nice thing to think about this is if you, if you think of CP1, right, the point in CP1 is a vector in C2. So if you take a vector in C2, you can, 
except for, uh, so you can take uh, standard basic E1 and E2 of C2. And now you can write any vector which is not E2, you can write um, as a vector of the form Z1. Uh, sorry, any vector which is not, uh, not E1, you can write as a vector of this form. And now if you act with a 2 by 2 matrix A, B, C, D, how do you act on it? So you get, it send, you send it to A, C plus B, C, Z plus D. But now we want to rewrite it somehow in this, uh, in this form. So this is precisely A, Z plus B divided by C, Z plus D, 1. Right? And so we think of the group of Möbius uh, transformations as the group of uh, two by two matrices over the complex numbers with determinant one. And uh, you actually have to model, I mean, you see this here. If, if you take the, uh, minus the identity, you have minus one, minus one, and that's the same way as the identity. So we will actually look at, it's actually PSA. 2c, so it's SA2c quotient by plus minus the identity. So okay, so um, let me just uh, give you uh, two facts um, about the group of Möbius transformation. So perhaps one, I mean, one, one word about also about having this as a group. So of course, if you, I mean, you. If, with this definition, you have to check that if you take twice, uh, write two uh, fractional linear transformation, compose them, you can rewrite them as one fractional linear transformation. And if you do that, you realize this is just matrix multiplication in this group. Right? So one fact, and this is again something I'm not going to prove, but you can do as an exercise. So if you look at the Möbius transformations, um, this um, well, let me write it in the way. The Möbius transformations are conformal. And these are um, maps which preserve angles. So you have to check this on the derivative of the map, right? So Möbius transformations are conformal and actually map uh, circles uh, to circles. And uh, um, so by circles, I mean generalized circles. And um, one way to see the second property is, uh, and I'm not going to write it, but it's one of the exercises in the, uh, on the exercise sheet is, uh, to, see, to check two things uh, for Möbius transformation. So first, that if you have a Möbius transformation and you apply it to all the four points of which you take the cross ratio, you don't change the cross ratio. So the Möbius transformation preserves the cross ratio. So this is its group of symmetry. And then you can, the second thing you have to check is that um, being four points on the circle is actually a property you can express with the cross ratio. Right? And then you get um, this. Okay, so we, uh, this was a short uh, digression and we will, um, uh, we might come back to uh, Möbius transformation. We will definitely come back to this group PSL2C um, later. But now I want to discuss uh, two, the two other uh, very common models for the hyperbolic plane. And these are probably the models um, all of you have seen already, the Poincaré disk and the upper half plane. So. Um, so to get the Poincaré disk, we do something similar as what we did to get the Klein model. So we want to uh, somehow use a projection of the hyperboloid uh, to a plane, but we, uh, we choose a different plane to which pr to project, and we choose a different point from which we project. So um, let me draw a picture of the hyperboloid here again. So here we have one, zero. Now we take uh, minus one, and now we basically project uh, the, so we, we take a plane through zero and we project 
the hyperboloid by taking a ray from minus 1 to a point on the hyperboloid and we look at where it intersects uh, this uh, plane. And when you do that you will get again uh, disk, actually the interior of a disk in um, this plane and we think of this two plane as a copy of C. So the interior of the disk, so point of, of norm. Um, it's more than one where this plane is just, I mean if you think of the uh, Minkowski scalar product restricted to this plane, this is just the Euclidean scalar product. Okay, so um, how does, you now if you look at the Poincaré um, this, you can look at how do, um, how do geodesics look like. So this is uh, something which is probably already so. So geodesics are uh, circular arcs which are perpendicular to the boundary of the disk. So they're, I mean, they come in uh, in some sense, two flavors. So you have circular arcs uh, through zero, which are circular arcs of infinite diameter. So these are just straight lines, or there could be circular arcs of finite uh, diameter. Um, one reason why um, this model is, uh, is some one which is used quite often and is very nice is that you can write down the metric on. Um, this uh, Poincaré disk in terms of the Euclidean metric uh, on C2 where you just have to rescale the metric depending on where po which point you have uh, where you are in the in the hyperbolic plane. So let me write it down. So if you want to look at the, so the Riemannian metric, this is the um, hyperbolic Riemannian metric um, at the point uh, Z. So this is um, the just Euclidean scalar product um, at the point. So let's write uh, E. So at the at the same point, but the Euclidean scalar product is constant, so I don't write the point. But now with a factor which depends on um, your the norm of your point Z. So it's so you you normalize your Euclidean scalar product by a factor. Which gets bigger and um, which gets bigger and bigger, the closer you go to the boundary. So, if you if you look at how things look in the in in the Poincaré disk, if you are at the point zero, everything basically looks like you're in Euclidean space. And the more you go out to the boundary, the smaller the things look for your Euclidean eye. Uh, being the same size in the hyperbolic plane. So if you take something which hyperbolically doesn't change, but you, you walk it out to the boundary for your Euclidean eye, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And the boundary of the disk is infinitely far away from every point in the interior. So it's, okay, so this, this metric is um, one's called conformal to the Euclidean metric, so it just means that at every point it just varies by a positive uh, constant and this has the the consequence that if you measure distances they might be different but if you measure angles in the Poincaré disk with respect to this metric it's pre precisely the same as measuring it with the Euclidean distance and so this makes it uh, very nice and you could for example um, let's write it uh, you could use that to show one of the um, nice properties uh, of the hyperbolic uh, plane, which you can uh, try to explain to any uh, school uh, kid who sees Euclidean geometry, namely that if you take a triangle in the hyperbolic space, the sum of the interior angles is not 180 degrees, as we learn in school, but it's actually smaller than 180 degrees. So if you take a triangle formed by Three geodesics, we would have here this circular arc, and clearly this angle is smaller than when you take the straight line. So, some of the angles is smaller than 180 degrees. Okay, so let's. Um,
So how do I get the top board? Between. Between? Ah, sorry. Sorry. So now let's uh, just take the last um, model, so the upper half plane model, and that's the second. I mean, I would say the uh, Poincaré disk and upper half plane model is probably the one, I mean, the two com most common ones you see. So here you have um, H. You take also. Com I mean, think of it as a subset of the complex plane. Now take points where the imaginary part uh, that is positive. So imaginary axis, so you have this subset of the hyperbolic plane. And you can again write uh, the metric um, as a conformal metric just using the uh, Euclidean, uh, Euclidean structure, where now you have to normalize by uh, the size of the imaginary part. So I'm thinking of this uh, real line as being infinitely far away. So you uh, write down the uh, hyperbolic metric as 1 over uh, imaginary part squared, the Euclidean the Euclidean scalar product. Okay, so um, you have here, uh, again, that geodesics are uh, circuits perpendicular to the boundary. And one way to, um, to see that is to write down an explicit map between the Poincaré disk model and the upper half plane model, which is usually called the Cayley transform. So this is a map takes a point in the disk, send it to the upper um, upper half plane, <coughs> and uh, you can write it explicitly as uh, uh, I have to check. Hope I did it correctly. So z minus i over z plus i. So you should check again. Make me let me make one comment. So if you remember our fraction linear transformation, our Möbius transformation. This is a Möbius transformation, right? There's just one specific Möbius transformation. And this, uh, this tel tells you that uh, there's something, I think there's something wrong. So you should check the form. But uh, uh, this tells you that if you, since Möbius transformation sends circles to circles, um, that, I mean, whatever property you have on the Poincaré disk actually hold on the upper half plane. So, okay, so um, let me now make one last uh, comment about this, uh, one, one last thing I point, want to point out as of this model of the hyperbolic plane. So if you want to um, understand what is the group of isometries of uh, this, this space as a Riemannian metric, Actually, it's, it's very useful and convenient to do this in these uh, models um, because you can basically uh, think of uh, trying to and having to check certain things. And I mean that, for example, geodesics are sent to geodesics. And, um, <coughs> and uh, when you, okay, distance I have to preserve, but when you try, no, you can very, uh, with not many, much difficulty, check that the group of isometries of both um, the upper half plane or the Poincaré disk is precisely the group of Möbius transformations which preserve your set. So the group of isometries of H um, with uh, respect to its Riemannian, me Riemannian metric is um, the set of Möbius transformations of um, of C, 
hat. I will think of this as sitting in C hat, such that f of the upper half plane is actually uh, the upper half plane. And what I mean, then you have to check what what basically what do you need to preserve the upper half plane? You have to preserve its boundary, which is the real line, right? So the real axis. So you know, just have to look at Möbius transformations preserving the real axis. And if you look at it, which um, elements of these two by two complex matrices of determinant one preserve the real axis, get that this happens if and only if the coefficients are real. So you want to get that this is PSF to R. And if you do the same, uh, if you do the same exercise uh, with the Poincaré disk model, you get a group which, of course, I mean these are equivalent uh, Riemannian manifolds. So you get a group which is the same group of isometries, but you will get it in a different way uh, embedded into the group of Möbius transformations. You will get it embedded as what is known to be the group of PSU one one, and I'm not going to. Right, but it's just uh, some of you have different conditions on the on the coefficients of the matrix, which are not that they are uh, real, but that uh, uh, you have some certain uh, another involution which has to be preserved. Okay, so this is um, basically all I want to say about uh, how the hyperbolic plane looks like. I just want to make uh, two uh, two or three comments, which I'm not going to be. Uh, precise about, and you might see this in other uh, things. So there, so there are certain combinatorial properties, if you want, or properties of the hyperbolic plane, which uh, you can abstract uh, from, and you don't have to think of uh, Riemannian manifold anymore, but which capture a lot of the hyperbolic behavior of the metric. So one is the growth of balls. So if you look at uh, balls of radius r, and you let r go to infinity, if you are in Euclidean space, they grow uh, polynomial. If you are in hyperbolic space, the volume of balls, in, uh, uh, depending on R, grows exponentially. And this is one important property of hyperbolic space, but which you can also generalize to other uh, spaces, even discrete spaces, if you want. The other is that, I mean, we saw, I mentioned here, I mean, that the sum of angles, inner angles in a triangle is smaller uh, than 180 degrees. So to say, to talk about this, you have to have a notion of angles, but you can also characterize that somehow uh, tri triangles in hyperbolic space are thin and thinner than in Euclidean space. And this is, a, uh, again, a property you can uh, abstract from the setting of Riemannian manifolds and think of it as an, in an arbitrary metric space um, or a graph even. So uh, these are interesting properties and this Especially um, some of these properties, uh, currently uh, uh, there's a whole group of people who, is not, who are not mathematicians interested in this. So, the, the, so there are quite a few people in machine learning who start to look at hyperbolic geometry as a tool to um, look, do embeddings of graphs in a, in a better way than and doing that in this in Euclidean space. And one of the key features there is that you have this exponential growth um, of balls. But I think it's, it's really nice and it's, it's a way to get other people interested in hyperbolic geometry and also to see that actually it's, it's useful um, in, in aspects where you didn't, didn't necessarily think about when, um, yeah, when studying hyperbolic geometry. Okay, so now we have the hyperbolic plane. Now we want to uh, look at how can we endow a surface um, with a hyperbolic structure. And um, uh, so let me so let me just write two so hyperbolic structure on a surface. So the first thing is, and this is in some sense the way we thought about it right in the beginning, is to create an atlas. So to take charts on your surface and put them in a the hyperbolic plane and have um, the coordinate transformations are um, isometries of the hyperbolic plane. So put this in H2. Um, so I don't want to, I mean, this is a very nice setting and really fits nice in the I mean, theory of differentiable manifolds, but 
And sometimes if I give you a surface, it's not so easy to give me an atlas. So, um, so I don't want to say anything more about that. So there's a second thing you could uh, think of, and this is if you think of the, uh, if I give you a torus, how do you put a Euclidean structure on the torus? So the, in some sense, one of the easiest ways to describe a Euclidean structure on the torus is, say, is to say, well, I take a sheet of paper and I glue my torus this way. And another way to say that is uh, to say I look at R, R2 and I look at the, just the integer grid on R2. And then I look at the symmetries of that uh, tessellation of R2. And then I mod out R2 by the symmetry. So I identify um, um, the quotient. I can identify the quotient then with this fundamental piece. And by if I act by translations of the grid, I mean this side is identified with this side, and this side is identified this with this side. And so in this way, in some sense, in order to give you a torus, a Euclidean structure on a torus, I can give you a tessellation or I can give you the symmetry group of a tessellation. And so the same thing we can do to get a hyperbolic structure on a surface. So we have H2. We want to find a tessellation of H2. And then, or just think of, forget about the tessellation, just think of the um, symmetry group of this tessellation. So we can think of a, a tessellation or its symmetry group. And so this uh, means if I just think of this symmetry group, so this is a subgroup of the group of isometries. So this would be a subgroup gamma in the group of isometries, which we saw as PSA4. So you can also think of giving a hyperbolic structure by giving a subgroup of PSA2R, uh, uh, which is um, discrete, which will actually be a lattice because in the end we want a compact uh, uh, surface uh, downstairs. And of course, it's, I mean, for this, to, for this group to really give you a surface, the, this group will have to be isomorphic to the fundamental group of, um, of that surface. And Let me just um, write this or let call the surface as G. So how does the fundamental group of that surface uh, look like? So I can pick a base point and then now basically I do the same as what I do for the torus. For the torus I take two loops which go around somehow one as the meridian, one as the longitude. And so here I do that for every handle, for every torus I see. So I have um, two curves for this handle, and I have two curves for this handle. And so I can think of the fundamental group as being generated by pairs A1, B1, up to AG, BG. So a pair of each handle. And then I have to have one relation, which is if I go around these things, uh, I end up at the, at the trivial loop. So which gives you a relation saying that if you take A, I, B, I, and you take the commutator, so this is A, I, B, I, A, I inverse, B, I inverse, then the product of all these commutators has to be the trivial element. Um, so this is another way, and uh, you probably saw, I mean, you saw things about discrete subgroups uh, and lattices already. Um, I might come back to this. I will come back to this uh, in the in the next uh, hour. But now I want to describe you a, a different uh, third possibility, and this is uh, to somehow try to take your surface and cut it into very simple pieces and give a hyperbolic structure on each of the simple pieces and then glue a hyperbolic structure on the surface out of the pieces. So, um, yeah, yes? Can, can you take any subgroup of PSL2R that's isomorphic to a surface? No, uh, it has to be discrete. Okay, and can you find surface groups that are not discrete? Yes. Okay. So. <coughs> 
OK, so uh, the other is cut into simple pieces and try to put a high bubble egg structure on the simple piece and then glue it back. And for this, there's um, a nice tool. Um, so basically, we want to. So I mean, the, the way to do that is to cut a surface and cut it um, into what uh, people call pairs of pants. So take S G and cut it into pairs of pants. So what's a pair of pants? A pair of pants is. Uh, this thing with three holes, right? Um, and how do you cut a surface into a pair of pants? So you have to pick enough uh, disjoint, simple, closed curves on your surface um, that the complement you see is just uh, pairs of pants. So here we have one pair pairs of pants, and we could take this one, and this one. And there are many different choices. I mean, you could take a different uh, choice. So what's now the, the key uh, point? So we take such a pair of pants and we want to understand how can we put a hyperbolic structure on this pair of pants. And now we make it uh, even simpler. So we cut this pair of pants and uh, we c can cut it into two uh, hexagons by taking um, a perpendicular from this uh, curve to this curve, from this curve to this curve, and from this curve to this curve. Right? So, so think of starting. I mean, uh, I mean, think of starting with a surface which has a hyperbolic structure. We want to decompose and understand what does wh how is the hyperbolic structure? How does it look like on the piece? And then we use this information to somehow build a hyperbolic structure on a surface where we don't have one. So, if we have a hyperbolic structure, we take these uh, geodesics, and there will be, I mean, this is topologically always the same number, so there, there will be 3g minus 3 pairwise disjoint simple closed geodesics. If you cut along them, <coughs> you get. Uh, 2g minus 2 pairs of pants. And then we can take each pair of pants, take the perpendicular between two of its boundary components, and we cut it into a <coughs> hexagon. OK, so if we start with a hyperbolic surface, with, uh, so surface with a hyperbolic structure, I mean, each of this curve has a length. So when we cut, each of these curves has a length, and when we cut uh, it into the hexagon, each of uh, these curves, so let's them, which correspond to the, to the holes in your pair of pants, has a length. Namely, it's half the length of the uh, simple closed curve you had. So A, B, C. And now there's a nice uh, fact of hyperbolic geometry that if you look at right-angled hexagons, um, where you know three of the side lengths of the some of, uh, distributed in this pattern, there's actually a unique way how you, up to isometry, how you can construct such a hexagon in the hyperbolic plane. So there's there is a unique um, hexagon in H2 with a unique right angled uh, with these side lengths. And this is again, I mean, this is now makes it much easier. We start with a complicated object. Now we have a somehow really a small piece of hyperbolic plane. And I mean, this is again something you could prove in the exercises that you have. Uh, that. So this is elementary construction in the hyperbolic plane. 
But now, then when we have that, now we can go backwards. So if I uh, want to find a hyperbolic structure on the surface, right, what I do, I have my surface which has no geometry yet, but I can, I mean, it has some topology and I can topologically decompose it into pairs of pans by just taking simple closed curves, not necessarily geodesics because I have no geometric structure to talk about geodesics, but I cut it just topologically in these two G minus two pair of pans. And I think of each pair of pans as being decomposed into two hexagons. And so now whenever I specify for each pair of pans this length, side length, this side length, and this side length, I can, I can construct these two right angled hyperbolic hexagons and I can glue them together and I get a hyperbolic structure on this pair of pans with the prescribed side lengths, uh, L1, L2, L3. So given L1, L2, L3, any positive real numbers, there exists a unique uh, hyperbolic pair of pans. Pans. Uh, with these side lengths. Okay, so now I have my building blocks. I have these hyperbolic pairs of pans, and if I want to uh, get a hyperbolic structure on this more complicated surface, I take just as many pairs of pans um, as, as I need, and I build it. I just have to make sure that, I mean, if I take this pair of pans, I take one where, I mean, if I cut it here, these two curves have the same side length. And if I want to glue those two, I just have to uh, make sure that these two have the same uh, side length and so on. So if I uh, basically describe you the 3G minus 3 um, curves, si uh, length parameters, I can build a hyperbolic structure which has uh, for this given pan's decomposition, these um, uh, these side length for the simple closed geodesic, um, realizing that. Okay, so this is one um, way to uh, construct a hyperbolic structure on the surface. And um, what I want to discuss in, I mean, after the coffee break, is in some sense how you can use uh, this way of constructing and giving a hyperbolic structure to also understand. What the, how the space of all hyperbolic structures on a surface looks like. And um, let me just uh, make one uh, last uh, comment here. So if you, you might be interested in surfaces which are not closed, but which have boundary or punctures or something. And there's actually another very um, much related way of giving a hyperbolic structure on this, on such an object, is that if you have this, say, just one, uh, mark point, for example, on the surface, you can decompose your surface not into pair of pans, but into ideal triangles. So you can make a triangulation of your surface where all the vertices of the triangles are in your specified uh, mark points. And if you do that, you can think of cutting your surface into some ideal triangles. And if you think of how does a hyperbolic structure on an ideal triangle looks like, so how does hyperbolic structure look like on a triangle where all the vertices are at infinity, you realize that on the, in the, actually in the hyperbolic plane there's up to isometry, again a unique ideal triangle. So you, you don't have to, I mean you don't specify anything because all the sides have infinite length, right? So, so on each of these triangles you have a unique hyperbolic structure and now you can think of the hyperbolic structure on your surface again as being glued um, out of these triangles and so you have to understand how, uh, how you can glue two triangles and what is the parameter uh, to glue two triangles. So, um, and there is a nice, if you um, look at this picture of the hyperbolic plane, so I have two triangles, you want to identify one of the edges and uh, the other, glue another triangle, so you have an ideal quadrilateral, you see four points on the circle. And the cross ratio of these four points on the circle, where the, again, this, you think of the circle as a, um, as a line or extended line, R and infinity, is precisely the invariant uh, of how you can glue uh, two ideal triangles. And there's, uh, there are two things which are, I mean, one thing which is very difficult for 
uh, pairs of pants is if you have one pair of pants decomposition and you change to another pair of pants decomposition, how do lengths and things uh, change? And this is something which is much easier for uh, uh, gluing things out of triangles. So there's very nice formulas and very nice structure. If you think of how does the cross ratio change of these four tuple of points, um, when you somehow take a think of the four tuple of points thought in a different way, so one of the symmetries of the cross ratio would give you a lot of nice structure um, for surfaces with with puncture. Okay, so let's have a coffee break.